In the 19th century, the Austrian capital of Vienna was a melting pot of cultures from all parts of the monarchy. Especially prevalent was the Czech-speaking minority that made up about one quarter of the city's population at one point. Now, believe it or not, but this made Vienna, and not Prague, the largest Czech city at the time. But why? What inspired so many people to start a new life in this foreign city? How were they treated there, and what were their living conditions? And why are so few of them left today? Czech migration to Vienna began to take off in the second half of the 18th century. It was mostly skilled workers who found a new life in the Austrian capital, and they usually settled in the districts of Wieden and Landstraße. Their arrival was purposefully encouraged by Empress Maria Theresia. She abolished the necessity for workers to belong to the German nation, and made it easier for foreigners to open up a workshop. The reason for that can be found in the previous loss of the valuable province of Silesia, which made it necessary to compensate for the loss of industry. It is difficult to estimate how many people from the Czech lands ended up in Vienna at that time, because a big portion of them had married into German-speaking families or adopted a Germanized name for easier communication. Also, keep in mind that population censuses, like the ones that we're used to, weren't really a thing yet in the 18th century. It is true that Maria Theresia initiated a countrywide census in the 1750s in order to gain a better grasp of the economic situation of her subjects, but due to the resistance of the nobility and the clergy, this remained the only one of its kind for more than 100 years. However, due to some sources we have, it's safe to say that the number was reasonably high. For example, in 1761, the very first Viennese newspaper in Czech appeared, the Imperially Privileged Viennese Postpaper. But its success was short-lived, and it was discontinued after just 26 issues. Then there was also the Military Academy of Wiener Neustadt, which began to teach Czech to its students, and shortly after, the Theresian Academy did the exact same thing. In 1775, a professorship for Czech was opened up at the University of Vienna by none other than Emperor Joseph II. Three years later, the Emperor demanded that all announcements in Wieden and Landstraße must be bilingual, Czech and German. We also know that there were a number of restaurants and pubs where Czech was the dominant language. In the 19th century, Czech immigration increased drastically. The economy had changed and Austria was beginning to industrialize. Financed with massive credits, hundreds of new manufacturers sprung up all over Vienna. In the textile and in the metal industry, the century-old mandatory guild membership was abolished, which heavily raised the demand for workers. The new factories required cheap and untrained labour, which made it possible to mass-produce things like cloth and steel. Despite the terrible and unhygienic working conditions, which included 14-hour workdays, immigration from the Czech lands continued uninterruptedly in the entire 19th century. New train lines were built, such as the Kaiser Ferdinand Nordbahn, connecting the capital with the industrial region surrounding the Moravian town of Oderberg. This allowed a new form of mobility and drastically increased population movement. Perhaps unsurprisingly, most immigrants didn't come from the German-speaking border areas, but instead from rural regions in southern Moravia and southern Bohemia. The more industrialized parts surrounding Prague and Brunn were only slightly affected by this phenomenon as well. As the 19th century went on, immigration from Bohemia decreased and was instead redirected to the emerging city of Prague, while the Moravians kept Vienna as their preferred destination. By 1910, a whopping 25% of the Viennese population, or about 500,000 people, were born inside the Czech lands. You have to keep in mind that the actual number must have been higher, as seasonal workers were not included into those statistics. Of those 500,000 people, about 100,000 claimed that they spoke Czech on a daily basis. For various reasons, most Czechs preferred to claim during surveys that they were actually German speakers. Now, why exactly did so many people decide to leave their homes? First and foremost, it was for economic reasons. In the late 19th century, people living in the Moravian or Bohemian countryside were not having a good time, to put it bluntly. There was an agrarian crisis which caused the price for sugar and wheat to plummet. Add to that the fact that a small number of estate owners relentlessly attempted to increase the size of their property, while other farmers insisted on the indivisibility of their lands, and you have a situation in which many people just don't see a future. And Vienna seemed like the perfect place to go. The imperial capital evoked pictures of glamorous marble palaces, wide streets and an extravagant lifestyle. 
Many also heard of the higher salaries, shorter working hours, and better social security systems the city had to offer. The Viennese industry was booming after all, and it needed more and more workers. Immigration was made even more attractive by the already existing Czech immigrants who managed to build up a vast support network. Oftentimes, Viennese companies actively sent out recruiters to hire new employees. However, the reality of the situation was often disappointing. A common type of accommodation were workers' quarters. Those were essentially barracks that were directly owned by the companies the workers were employed at. Factory owners hoped that this would increase productivity, as the workers were practically unable to integrate into their new city and have a life apart from their work shifts. Life in those quarters was usually miserable, as people were tightly packed together in tiny quarters without sufficient amenities. Viktor Adler, the head of the Social Democratic Party, attempted to draw attention to those catastrophic living conditions by dressing as a mason and sneaking into a number of brick factories in Wienerberg. Here's what he had to say in an article called The Situation of the Brick Workers. There are miserable workhouses for the brick makers. In every single room, so-called chambers of these huts, three, four to ten families sleep in each, men, women, all mixed up, one under the other, one on top of the other. There they lie then, those poor people, without a sheet, without a blanket. All drags form the underlay, their dirty clothes serve as coverings. Some take off their only shirt to spare it and lie there naked. It is natural that bedbugs and lice bedfellows are common. But even if they were lucky enough to have their own flat, their living conditions would still have been terrible. In the districts of Favoriten and Simmering, 15% of people lived in overcrowded flats. Overcrowded in that sense meant four or more people on 16 square meters. As a result, child mortality was much higher in those areas than in the more well-off parts of Vienna. Those flats were often subterranean or only had windows towards the staircase. The kitchen was tiny and of course they didn't have their own bathroom. The smell was terrible and tenants' rights were a foreign concept. But don't you think that life was at least cheap? As a result of the rapidly increasing population, speculation with housing became an unfortunate reality. While expensive properties along the extravagant Ringstraße bore about 2.5% interest on average, the average interest rate for houses in the working class districts of Favoriten and Otterkring was about 10%. In general, workers gave away one-fifth of their income just to have a place to sleep. Some very, very unfortunate individuals belonged to the group of so-called night lodgers. Those were usually young men who, in exchange for a fee, slept in a free bed in someone else's flat on an hourly basis or for as long as their work shift lasted. In many cases, they even had to share that bed with someone else. For around every ninth Viennese Czech, this seemed to be their only option. What did most Czechs in Vienna work as? More than 75% worked as workers in certain industries. By comparison, less than half of the local population worked there. 13.8% worked in the trade and transport sector, 12.2% in the public sector, and a negligibly small part in the agricultural sector. Most worked in textile, metal or electrical factories in the Vienna Basin, on large construction sites and especially in the brickworks located in the southern part of the city. Czech people were so prevalent in the brick factories that the term Ziegelboom or brick bohemian began to spread quite quickly in Viennese society. In the aforementioned article, Viktor Adler goes on to describe the dreadful situation of the brick workers. Apparently, workers in the summer received about six gulden per week. Most of the time, however, they received small metal discs instead that could be exchanged for food at the factory's cafeteria. You can imagine that those cafeterias charged inhumane prices for low-quality goods and were just a way for factory owners to make sure that the money stayed in their pockets. Oftentimes, they also had to buy their own work equipment with those metal discs. The majority of Czech women didn't work in the industries. Instead, they largely worked in the service sector. Especially lucrative was a job as a maid in a well-off household. This occupation had the big advantage that their food and their shelter was provided for them, even if it was just a small, dark room. Others worked as nannies, cooks or wet nurses. Jobs in a factory were usually very unpopular among women because that meant that they had to share a room with a male worker. By the 1880s, almost half of all servants in Vienna were born in the Czech lands. 
To most women at that time, a job was a temporary solution until marriage, so to speak. Many Czech people were torn between their two identities. It was obvious that you needed to learn German and integrate into Viennese society in order to advance in your life. On the other hand, completely throwing away and abandoning your old identity is rarely an option. So most Czechs simply began to identify themselves as Viennese people rather than Czech or German. That internal conflict was especially prevalent among second generation immigrants. The opinion of Viennese people about the Czech immigrants differentiated massively from person to person. Some liked them, others didn't. While many appreciated their help in the household and the hard work that they were putting up with on a daily basis, others mocked them for their broken German, their names or for their occupation. Many fell victim to the Wiener Schmier, a classic Viennese humour which is centred around teasing and provoking. Usually the Schmier is not meant to hurt the other person, but rather just entertainment in a morbid way. This humour is not for everyone, obviously, and many did feel offended. Maybe that is the reason why Vienna keeps getting voted as the most unfriendly city in the world, so it's nice that traditions do not change. On a more serious note, there were some Viennese people who were genuinely scared of a Slavicized, majorly Czech Vienna, and who called for a stop to immigration. Those concerns stemmed largely from German national and Christian social spaces. The first concrete call for action was taken in a municipal council proposal in 1892. It argued that the increasing unemployment should be stopped by limiting Czech immigration. However, the real era of discrimination did not begin until Mayor Karl Luiga came to power in 1897. He wanted to preserve the German character of the city, and some measures were indeed taken. After March of 1900, people who wanted to become citizens of Vienna had to take an oath in front of the mayor to preserve the German character of the city with all their power. This essentially meant that they had to promise not to join any Czech associations or clubs. Multiple municipal councillors brought forth suggestions that would have made it more difficult for Czech speakers to find a job in private or public positions. And indeed, during the increasing anti-Czech sentiment, some employers just outright refused to hire anyone who didn't appear like a pure German to them. At the turn of the 20th century, the number of Czech migrants began to decrease drastically. Bohemia and Moravia had begun to increasingly industrialize, and many Czechs preferred to go back home. Others, who had never arrived with the intention of staying, took the money they had managed to save up in Vienna in order to have a comfortable life in the Czech lands with the new knowledge they had gained during their years in the Austrian capital. After the end of World War I, 150,000 Viennese Czechs settled over to the newly founded Czechoslovak Republic. The small mountain Republic of Austria with its huge capital was just not seen as sustainable by too many people. Instead, they wished to build up the first independent Czech state for centuries and become first-class citizens. This decline in Czech people continued well into the 1940s. According to a census from 1923, only 81,000 Czechs remained. By 1934, that number had dropped to 39,000. Again, take those numbers with a massive pinch of salt, as a big number of Czechs just claimed that they spoke German on a daily basis. This is especially true for the 1934 census, as it was taken during the Dolfus dictatorship shortly after the end of the February uprising. Many Czech people had close ties to the illegal Social Democratic Party, and were therefore afraid of disclosing their true identity. Still, the decline of the Czech population is clearly visible, and by the 1950s most people had left Vienna. Still, a small portion remained, and in 1977 they were recognised as a national minority. Still, the influence of the Czech language can be seen in today's Austrian dialect. For example, the word palachinken for pancakes comes from the Czech palachinki, whereas we would just say Pfannkuchen in Germany. Other examples include Kren instead of Mirettich and Povidl instead of Pflaumenmus. On top of that, many Austrians still bear Czech surnames such as Novak, Svoboda and Pokorny, sometimes without even realizing it. Alright then, danke schön for watching the video and I hope you've learned something. If you did, a like and a subscribe are always appreciated. A very special and grateful thanks goes out to A Cup of Tea, Drix and Tristan Kriegsmann for their generous support over on Ko-Fi. You are fantastic. Have a very wonderful day and see you next time.